Hey guys, welcome to another Mr. Maple Live. I'm Matt. Hey guys, I'm Tim. We appreciate everybody. Thanks so much for jumping in today's live chat. Make sure you smash that like button. And guys, we're going to be answering some questions today. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit first off about plant reversion and when's the times to check that out. And we're also going to go into Fun Flower Friday things as well. Yeah, you can also throw your questions in the chat and we'll be answering those as we can get to them. So guys, you know, if you don't know anything about us, we're MrMaple.com. We're a family mail order business. We ship directly to your door. And guys, we do really cool plants. We do over a thousand different varieties of Japanese maples. So check us out, MrMaple.com. Uh, also, we add 10 flowering plants every single Friday at 10 a.m. So guys, we're adding over 30 plants a week here on Mr. Maple. We actually had 20 on the 10 at 10 on Tuesdays. So there's always something new and exciting. Uh, after we get through a few of the early questions, we will break down a little bit of the Fun Flower Friday while you get your questions in the chat, and then we'll answer any questions we can get to. So guys, right now we're having a lot of people ask us about plant reversions. Now, certain types of Japanese maples that are variegated can revert, but not all the types can revert. So like in a Rita no Nishiki style, that may not show variegation. That's different from reversion. And then a Higashiyama style, something like an eye candy, something like a Yamanishki. Those might not show variegation, but that's not a true reversion because that variegation can come back. What we're talking about today is going to be types like Rainbow, Tamanishki, Fujinami Nishiki. If something like a Shiraz or Geisha Gone Wild or a Lillian's Jewel throws on a solid red branch, that is considered a reversion. And typically those don't necessarily always uh, come back with variegated spots the next year. So often this is the time of the season to go in Look and see, you know, is this, does this have a solid branch on there? And that's really the best time to remove any of that variegation. If you have a really large plant that's got some reversion, the best thing you can do is come in and prune out maybe a third of it and then allow the variegated part of the tree to grow more and more and then come back later and prune off more of that reversion later as you're giving more energy to the variegated side. Dang, Michael James says, Nine days, 22 hours, and 58 minutes till open house. He always makes people nervous with these updates. Uh, we're getting as ready as we can, but that, man, that gets my heart pumping right there when you put it that way. Uh, we will be having our annual open house on Memorial Day. That's the Mr. Maple Festival. That'll be May 29th. Uh, we'll be opening the gate at 8 a.m. The event will lead till 4, and there's going to be some awesome stuff here, guys. So definitely come check us out if you have a chance on Memorial Day. Yeah, on that day, we're going to have more things available than we've ever had before. We're going to have a whole lot of plants that weren't available at any of the other open houses um, because a lot of those plants are gone. I mean, we've had a great spring, and then what we're doing is we're bringing up plants that have been finishing or finished off from down low at the lower part of the nursery. So there'll be a lot of fun stuff there that you didn't see at the first open house, you know, two months ago. There'll be some new Mr. Maple merch. we got some Maple Mafia hats. I'm rocking the puffy Maple Mafia trucker right now. Uh, we've got some funky Maple Mafia gear for you guys and, and more Mr. Maple hats as well, Mr. Maple show hats. So there'll be some cool uh, merch uh, available at Open House. And, uh, yeah, we're excited about it, guys. And, guys, that's going to be a busy day in Hendersonville. So if you haven't got your hotels yet, if you're coming from out of town, make sure to do that. Sunday to Monday is typically a little easier to get a hotel in Hendersonville right now then Saturday to Sunday. And our open house is on the Monday itself. So Memorial Day, Monday, 8 to 4 p.m. Uh, and we have a more of a hard cutoff at 4, so don't show up at, you know, 345 and expect to be able to see everything because we've got a large nursery here and a lot of cool plants to see. I mean, if you walk in uh, 15 minutes, you're not going to be able to get to see a lot of stuff. I mean, you can spend easily 15 to 30 minutes in each house and still not see everything. Yeah, guys, this could be a fun time. There'll be uh, a lot of 10 gallons. You've seen some of our walkthroughs around those 10 gallons. Uh, we still have a huge inventory. We've actually added to that. Um, off the top of my head, there will likely be some large Acer Camp Ester Carnivals. There will be some large species maples that you had not seen yet, so some Pseudosibaldianum, some Tinnianifolium, some really cool stuff you rarely see at you know that 8-foot kind of size range. Uh, there's some special plants in there. There's some big summer golds. There's some 10-gallon uh, shishigashiras. So there'll be some cool things that uh, weren't even in 10 gallons at the last open house. So 
Yeah, there'll be a ton of fun stuff. So, guys, you know, we've been putting a lot of larger material on the website right now. Uh, some of that does include that may, that makes it be more expensive to ship on the larger material. We are, we're charging the exact price that FedEx is charging us whenever it comes to shipping a six foot box that's going to have some giant trees in it. So y'all seeing the size of these plants on many of the tenant tens, you know, we're shipping the the biggest and best two and three gallon of you know some like awesome sizes of things. Jermaine's generation. Yeah. The key hacha joes that are three gallons Gage that barely fit in the box. So keep in mind, uh, uh, you know that is going to be a little more expensive to ship than two one gallons, but more things can go in those boxes. So you know sometimes when you start adding more and more trees into with a three gallon or two gallon, the shipping calculator might not work as accurate. So if you're getting a bunch of plants put in a box, sometimes it's good to call in Jody or the office to make sure you're getting the right quote. Once you add a lot of plants in a box with a, a two gallon XL Sometimes or a three gallon, can save you a little bit more if you check whether uh, there's instances where our system can't put it all in there. And if you check with Jody, sometimes she can actually, you know, work something out and make it a little bit better. Uh, we don't ship the 10 gallons. I had somebody a- ask in the, the chat uh, the 10 gallons are too heavy and too large. Those are uh, nursery pickup only. But in a few weeks, we may also have some six gallons coming on the 10 at 10. So we may of have some crazy stuff. Of some crazy stuff, which if they're still around, will be available at open <laughs> house. But that's a big if, <laughs> if they're still around, because right. there's some really cool items. Um, guys, we've got a lot of really cool things coming up in the works here at Mr. Maple. Um, Matt and I are actually planning a trip to Oregon. Um, yeah, I don't know if we're going to tell them about that already. But uh, yeah, we've actually been invited uh, by our good friend and mentor, Talon Buckholtz. So we're going to be doing some garden tours. We're actually flying Corbin out there with us to video it. Uh, so, yeah, guys, uh, right after Open House, Tim and I will be headed out to Oregon to spend some time with Talon and just capture some kind of crazy garden content for you guys as well. So so Matt and I have got a, a fun Oregon trip planned pretty soon. Um, but I'm a little afraid of flying into Portland right now. So if you have your Portland tips, let us know those also. Uh, we'll be flying into uh, Portland and spending about seven days checking out some of the crazy stuff with Talon Buckholtz. Yeah, so we've got some fun stuff planned in the near future. And because of that, we've been recording a lot of our tenant tens ahead of time right now. That means by the time you actually see the videos, you know, these plants may have an extra flush of growth on them too um, because that summer flush will be starting, you know, around that first week of June. But guys, we've got so much fun stuff planned. The open house is just the tip of the iceberg, and uh, I'm pretty excited. Matt's lime green hat is just driving me crazy every time I'm looking here at the video. I'm like, man, that thing is bright. I was wearing this one, and I also got the oak leaf trucker that I was rocking the other day (laughs) like this. And Tim's like, there's no way you're getting me to wear this. It's like like an oak leaf trucker hat with a maple mafia on it. And Tim's like, no, that ain't for me, dog. It's a hard pass for Tim. But uh, I, I like the funk, so I'm wearing the funky hats. I needed some big puffy trucker hats to brighten up my day. Uh, I d- I'm going to go through a few questions I've already got here. A um, uh, question from Anthony here. Uh, he asked about some of the best ways to create uh, rootstock inventory for home grafting. Uh, honestly, the best way for you is going to be to collect seeds yourself. So find an Acer palmatum, subspecies palmatum in your area. Uh, if you can get permission from somebody. They're pretty abundant most places once you start looking for them. Um, and, and get some seeds off there, collect it, stratify it, grow it yourself. Uh, we have a whole video on how to do that. If you want to want to check that out, you can learn all about that. Uh, that's going to be your best bet for the home grower and the, the small interest crafter. Most wholesale rootstock places are going to want way too many trees for you unless you're into ordering several, several thousand to get started, which doesn't really work out for most people that are going to do it on a novelist level. So I would highly suggest just growing your own seeds and you can go check out our video about how to grow seeds. And then there's also a how to grow seeds and how to graft in the same video as well. So we've got, we've got you covered on the information on how to do that, but uh, that's the best way typically. So John C asked for a six foot tall, two gallon. Is it one tree per box and it ships upright or two per box and ships sideways? So it actually can ship two per box. Our boxing calculator may not always work with that. So make sure you contact Jody at the office because we can save you on shipping whenever you're getting two of those two gallons. And only two two gallons can fit in a box. Two or a three gallon 
those XLs, but you can also fit up to six one gallons in that box as well. So just because you've got a big box, you can actually get a lot of big plants and a lot of plants in that box as well. Bruce Burton asked, when will Mr. Maple Merch be available online? And I promise you it's coming. Uh, we're a registered farm, so most of what we do goes through farm stuff. And we don't really produce or don't really have items here that we don't produce ourselves for the most part or grow. So uh, we're going to be doing that. We actually got sent the wrong information once. So we uh, had Nigel contact the state this week actually to reapply for some of that stuff. So we will be a drop in a merch store. It's coming. We'll have Mr. Maple t-shirts and hats, uh, maybe even some toboggan stuff like that on our merch store. We've got a, a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, I just like crazy stuff anyway. So anything that's maple centric, I'm going to, probably throw it out there. And we got a lot of fun ideas for t-shirt contests and things like that. So there's a lot of things we're going to do there. Uh, I mean, maybe we'll drop some Mr. Maple merch Mondays. Uh, I don't know, but there's some cool plant. There's cool plant related uh, merch that we'll be doing uh, for sure. And my goal is to get that online as soon as possible. Well, guys, we've got fun flower Friday coming this week and on fun flower Friday on today, you are probably starting to get the email right now. Uh, we've got a lot of cool plants. We've got, Azalea Astronaut, and that is a really, really large blooming evergreen azalea with variegated white blooms. And the blooms themselves can be four to five inches, and the blooms are white with sort of a pink orange, like a salmon pink kind of color. And it's a really cool dwarf Satsuki hybrid. It's a Holly Springs hybrid, and it's going to be more compact in its shape and its habit but have those really large variegated blooms. Yeah, great plant. That that really brings the high drama, guys. That That's a winner for sure. Uh, we're, we're always trying to bring you some of the best azaleas. Uh, we're, we've become kind of azalea fanatics in the last few years, so Tim and I have started collecting ourselves, and inevitably that leads to the things we like the most, making it onto our website as frequently as possible. Astronauts, it's a good one. That's, that's super cool. The thing I like about the Satsuki azaleas is they can handle sun and they're tight and compact. And when you have that, it's a great companion plant to Japanese maples. They bloom in the summer. Um, if you've got a sunnier location, you've got Japanese maples. Often something as small as a Satsuki azalea is an awesome accent plant in the garden. So, guys, next up we've got Hydrangea macrophylla Miss Sayori. Oh, man. This is... I mean, I know Alan LaFoe uh, comments this a lot. He got that one from us. He asked me what my favorite hydrangea was once. And I said Miss Sayori. And, uh, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a hard take, but I think it's probably correct still. Um, it, it's the best. It's just got everything going on for it. Amazing foliage, dark red foliage, uh, pink blooms with white accents to them. It, it's got it all. I think, I think Miss Sayori is one of the most interesting plants and uh, one you should definitely be adding to your garden. All right, guys, and just so you know, too, keep dropping those questions in the live chat. If you've got questions about gardening plants that we grow here at Mr. Maple or Japanese maple questions, throw those in the live chat or anything about, you know, Mr. Maple in general, we'll try to do our best to answer you in the live chat as well. Um, but we're also, we've been trying to answer some questions and go through some of our fun flower Friday items getting listed today. Today we've got azalea spring fanfare. Uh, it's an aromi azalea that's got these big golden yellow to orange trusses on it. Tim never uh, likes the yellow, so. <laughs> well, this is a native azalea by Dr. Eugene Aromi. He was a hybridizer down to, in Mobile, Alabama, and it's just an awesome plant that's got a spicy aroma for a native hybrid azalea. And so a really cool, you know, native azalea, that deciduous azalea, that's going to make a, those gorgeous yellow trusses out in the landscape and garden. There's some... Uh, I Andy said he was in the middle of watching PJ's Pond and Garden video and, and caught the live. Uh, shout out to him, Maple Maniac, Maple Nuts. There's so many cool channels popping up right now. PJ's Pond and Garden, I was watching some walkthroughs of his garden the other day. Uh, Maple Maniac, great content, too. All those guys are really rocking it out. Uh, so it's just fun to see the maple community grow in there. There's a lot of fun stuff. Uh, but, yeah, appreciate you guys hopping in our chat. So a lot of these plants that we have on Fun Flower Fridays now used to be parts of the 10 at 10. And so what we did years ago is we decided we need more room for more maples on the 10 at 10. Right. And so we moved a lot of these plants to the Fun Flower Friday. Things like this, this next item, Cornus Cusa Venus, was often one of our popular items on our 10 at 10s. And that's typically what we focused on are the woody ornamentals. So 
Uh, we kind of cheat by putting anything that flowers predominantly on Fun Flower Friday. Again, we're launching 30 plants a week here on Mr. Maple, so there's always cool stuff I mean, happening. Japanese maple flower, can we uh, start throwing some of those on the Fun Flower Friday? I mean, that wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> well, Cornus Cusa Venus is a large blooming Rutgers hybrid. Um, so it's got really huge white blooms. It's got one of the larger blooms that can get five to six inches on a Cornus Cusa. And so it's pretty awesome when it comes to that. Develops to about a tree that's 15 to 18 feet in 20 years. Uh, Rutgers has some amazing hybrids. I mean, they've done this weird hybrid work with Cornus Cusa, Cornus Florida, and Cornus Natalia to get some awesome plants that are disease-resistant and just crazy large blooms. And Venus was one of those cool plants from that hybrid work. Yeah, I sub all you guys, too. I love watching gardening content. It's fun. I, I felt pretty cool the other day. I'll throw this little tidbit in. I was walking around the uh, the Flat Rock Park over here, and this lady walked up to me. My kids are running around playing, and uh, she had literally just watched our video on YouTube. So I, I'm wearing a Mr. Maple hat. As I, If you find me out, I look the same at work as I do not at work. It's pretty much the same gear. I just have clothes I haven't worked in yet. That's really all I have. Uh, anyway, this lady walks up to me and I'm wearing a Mr. Maple hat and she was like, I was just watching you. And I'm like, from, from across the way. And she was like, no, on YouTube. And she was, and she looked at me really shocked because she literally just clicked off the video for the first time. And she said, and you're here. And I was like, yeah. And, you, and you're here too. And she was like, no, no, no. Like you're here locally. And I was like, yeah, my nursery is like five minutes from here. But like, she'd literally just found us for the first time. So it cracked me up. Uh, she was just shocked that I literally come walking up. It was just a weird coincidence, but uh, I felt cool that somebody had noticed it and, and been watching our show. So I like share little stories like that sometimes. So uh, Brian was out of town for the past few days, and I went to go feed his cat. I'm just telling this because everybody knows Brian rule too. And I went to go feed his cat with my wife. And we walked in there, and we were feeding his cat, and his cat's very shy. It doesn't show up. It doesn't show up and. Uh, it doesn't, it hides behind the couches. Well, I haven't seen the cat. My wife did. Well, we finished feeding the cat and went back up and locked Brian's house back up. And we walked outside and there was a cat there. I said, how did it get out? And Carlos started laughing. She said, you're about to put someone else's cat in Brian's house. Oh, no. Cause I was trying to chase this cat around Brian's front porch and it was a brown cat. And apparently Brian's cat's a black cat. Man, don't get them to feed your cat. So someone asked, how big does hot blonde get? Well, I always try to give the most honest answer. Uh, it, with Japanese maples, we always try to give a time frame. You know, with any maples, uh, sometimes people say the, the answer is the biggest one they ever saw. And what you end up with then is this kind of disingenuous stuff that doesn't work for gardeners or at maturity. I don't like that either because I, I think it doesn't really give, you know, an, a, an absolute understanding of what the sizes are. Hot Blonde is one of the fastest growing maples we grow. I've seen Hot Blonde put on well over a foot and a half of growth. I would say most seasons. Like it, it can give Sarah you a run for its money, if not faster. Um, one of my original ones is already pretty close to 20 feet, and uh, that one gets pruned pretty heavy for sign wood, so they can fill out pretty quickly. Uh, I would say you're probably going to end up with something that slows down a good bit, you know, as it starts to kind of finish out. It will slow down a good bit between that 20 to 25 foot phase. Uh, but as long as they're living and they're leafing out, they're going to continue to grow. So uh, the honest answer is they're always going to continue to grow um, easily, easily 15 foot in 10 years. So like if you're looking at a growth rate, uh, expect more than 15 foot in 10 years. So guys, next up on the Fun Flower Friday, we have a yellow variegated Japanese laurel called Mr. Goldstrike. It's an Akuba Japonica. And I like the Kuba Japonicas because they're evergreen and they've got that sort of waxy leaf to them. They give you that sort of exotic feel out in the landscape, um, but they're excellent screening plants. So mm -hmm. if you, and they're not, they're not very fast growers and they've got sh shallow non-invasive root systems. They and look great near Japanese maples too. This color pattern is going to show out amazing, you know, against red lace leaves. This one's going to work zone six through 10 too. So it's going to give you something comparable and zone for most people. And I like to use them as screen screening things so you can block smaller items that are you don't want people to see because these things are evergreen and they complement the Japanese maple so well in their texture and uh, on their being an evergreen. Variegation is always a plus as well. So Mr. Goldstrike is one of the most yellow variegated of the Japanese laurels. 
So PJ asked, he said, I got several uh, deciduous azaleas from you guys last fall. Everything's looking and back, leafing back out and looking great. Uh, should I anticipate blooms this year? It, it can. The honest answer is most of ours bloom in one gallons. So we do see blooms frequently in one gallons. Sometimes that first year when you plant them, it may stun them back one year while they're putting on root growth. So I've seen that happen as well. Uh, the honest answer is most likely yes. So coming up here on our next thing on Fun Flower Friday, we've got Styrax japonicus fragrant fountain. And this is a weeping Japanese snowbell. Gives you the white blooms everyone loves with the Japanese snowbells and that heavily cascading weeping habit. Mr. Styrax coming soon. I love Styrax. They're awesome plants. Little, uh, little known fact, the Fragrant Fountain is an introduction by Crispin Silva, who brought us Mystic Makawa. Yeah. So he's got an eye for plants for sure. Um, Fragrant Fountain, it's awesome if you stake it up and let it cascade downward. I mean, it can have a heavily, heavily cascading shape, almost like a Ryusin. Um, and so awesome weeping Styrax just to add texture out in the garden, but also those Japanese snowbell flowers that they're famous for. Hey guys, here's a little update too. We're actually moving our podcast room to a bigger room. We've got a big wooden table in front of us. So we're going to be able to sit across the table from some of the people we're interviewing. Uh, and so this podcast room is actually going to be expanding. Uh, we'll be able to do some different shots in there and hang up more of our maple art, as well as showcase a little bit more of our maple library. I was talking to Mina Malad late last night. He was telling me I really need to get more of our book collection and talk about that. And that's something we can do in our new setup for sure. Guys, next up is Osmanthus heterophilus Ogon. That's a yellow fragrant tea olive. And that's just such an awesome plant that stays very compact. I mean, we're talking three to four feet in height and width in 10 years. And in the fall, the white blooms on it are very sweet and add extra fragrance out in the landscape. But, I mean, this is such an awesome plant. I think I first... I uh, saw this uh, in Maryland at one of the gardens the Maple Society was visiting that uh, Barry Yinger was very instrumental in. And it's just such an amazing compact plant that gives you that false holly look, bright yellow foliage, but a dense compact form, and those fall blooms that everyone loves with the osmanthus. Yeah, guys, keep your questions coming too in that chat. So I'll keep checking that. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them in there. Um, we, we love to go over those and, and try to help any way we can. Uh, one thing people start to see during this part of the season is a little bit of aphids. So if you're noticing aphids in your garden, my typical recommendation is insecticidal soap. I think it's one of the safest ways to go. People often ask if they can create their own soap mixture. Um, and you can, but I don't recommend it because oftentimes there's different additives in your soap that could cause issues on your plant or your foliage. Insecticidal soap tends to be the safest bet. Yeah, I think the biggest mistake most people make is they start using antibacterial soap, and that can cause a lot of issues with plants. When they start trying to mix in antibacterial soap instead of regular soap, that's the biggest issue when people are trying to mix their own soap mixture. But guys, I've got a whole video on that too. You can go check out uh, on how to treat aphids on your Japanese maples. We've got a whole video on that and what's the safe thing you can do with your Japanese maples. Now, Guys, coming up next, we've got a Laurel Pedlum on here called Daruma. And uh, Daruma is kind of like a Japanese word for kind of like a little doll. So that when you see that worm Daruma on a plant, that often means it's more dwarf and compact. And that's exactly what this Chinese fringe uh, flower tree is. Uh, it's just got that denser, compact habit, three to four feet in height and width in 10 years. But on top of that, you get those red blooms. Yeah, so John S. asked here, he said he has an amber ghost with crispy leaves from staying too wet and, and overwatering. Will those leaves drop off and reflush? Uh, first and foremost, make sure to fix the situation where it's not staying too soggy. Uh, too wet is one of the easiest ways to kill a Japanese maple. They, they definitely can't handle continuously wet. So if you've caught it early enough and there's no root issues, typically yes. Uh, so don't cut that foliage off. Uh, let it dry out well. Uh, let it dry out pretty pretty thoroughly now. Uh, hit it with a light liquid fertilizer during this time of the year, like miracle Grow. Uh, you'll actually throw some buds back on there. Uh, you want to not overwater going forward, though, and don't over-fertilize with that light liquid fertilizer. About every two weeks is the max for that liquid fertilizer. Uh, just make sure not to overdo it going forward, but make sure the tree dries out completely. That'll help those buds get started. So, guys, next up we've got Gardenia radicans, jasmine, uh, Gardenia jasminoides radicans. 
And uh, this is a dwarf spreading gardenia. Uh, some people call them dwarf cape jasmines, but I'm more commonly known them as a gardenia. They add an extra aroma out there in the garden. And radicans is more of that low spreading. So we're talking two feet in height, five foot in width. The white blooms are really nice. Um, awesome just spreading habit on that. It just gives a unique shape for a gardenia. Yeah, Andy Disick asked, uh, to piggyback on MJ's question, um, how uh, can pH affect maple color? Now, there's some different theories on this. I do think it could have an effect. Um, I think that pH can probably affect maple colors. It affects so many other plant colors. I don't know if there's enough study done on that, but I definitely think it has some effect. I noticed that a lot of the Makawa seedlings especially color up much better in the ground with some morning sun. So if you're growing something like Mystic Makawa, I think that may even be more of a factor. I'm really interested to do some more research on that to kind of see if the pH is affecting it. But I definitely noticed the colors are better in the ground versus, uh, you know, synthesized soils. Now, I also know that not only can pH affect just the leaf color, but it can also affect the stem color of the plant and the, the trunk colors of the, the tree as well. And it'll be interesting for people to do some studies on that. Um, often I hear that a slightly more acidic soil will give redder colors on some of the more red Japanese maples and some brighter red colors. But there's also some things like micronutrients that play key roles in the colors of the plants. Like phosphorus is going to increase the amount of irrigation that you see um, often. And it's interesting. And if you get too much nitrogen in the soil or too much nitrogen, you know, you, you can actually get more chlorophyll being produced in the foliage. So you might get less of those red colors or less variegation. So there's a lot to play with whenever it comes to uh, colors. And not only just that, when you're talking about plants like eye candy and ukigumo, mm -hmm. you know, as slow as they leaf out also determines their spring color. And so there's so many environmental factors that play key roles here. Um, I can even think about the one time we had heavy droughts here in Western North Carolina and trees were, were way greener. Trees were way greener because they had to get more chlorophyll into the leaves. So plants like Tamukiyama that never changed color, they you know, changed color because there wasn't a cloud in the sky for months on end. And so there's so many environmental factors that play when it comes to the color on a Japanese maple. Nitrogen is a huge factor there too. Probably more than pH. You know, nitrogen and lighting are probably the first things that come into play there. But there's definitely factors of pH as well. That was an excellent question. Uh, the next one I've got is uh, for Fun Flower Friday is Coronado Red, and that's a three-inch blooming clear red, evergreen azalea. I mean, it's been named the rhododendron of the year with the American Rhododendron Society. That may confuse people, but all azaleas are rhododendrons. Uh, not all rhododendrons are azaleas, but uh, so many cool rhododendrons out there, and... You know, Coronado Red as an evergreen azalea has made an, a, the one of the rhododendrons of the year with the Rhododendron Society. Yeah, that's a cool one for sure. Now, uh, Leroy Jenkins just asked, he said, just planted a one-gallon Crimson Queen in Texas clay soil in a wet, somewhat shady corner. I've got tons of mulch around it. Uh, anything else I can do to help it in those conditions? So make sure the soil around the Crimson Queen isn't staying soggy. Uh, if it is, you may need to berm it up or raise that. I would recommend going ahead and moving it if it's actually staying damp to the touch around the tree. Uh, you also want to make sure, you know, mulch is your friend, especially in that Texas heat that's going to cool things down around it. You want to make sure that you don't have mulch too close to the base of your tree. I typically, especially if you plant a one gallon, I would expose just the top of that whole root ball uh, from the mulch for now and don't have anything piled up against it too close. That can cause more issues, especially if it's staying hot and wet there. Uh, but check that soil. You may want to make sure it's draining very well. And uh, that mulch is a great way to cool things down. Sounds like you got a good shady spot there, which is perfect for that. But if it is staying too wet, you may have to raise your height up a little bit on where it's planted. Uh, I got a question here from Andrew J. Bernias. Are there any new Elysium varieties coming to Fun Flower Friday this year? Uh, and then specifically Swamp Hobbit. There are a lot of Elysium varieties coming uh, to Fun Flower Friday's in the next three or four weeks. Um, so keep and keep watching because there are some cool Elysium varieties coming during those times. S not Swamp Hobbit specifically, but, you know. We if, do have that one, though. If, if I get that one in production, that one will definitely be one that 
I really need to get in production. I like yeah. its compact, dense habit. So some great questions today, guys. If you have any others, let us know. Um, again, Memorial Day will be our main open house for the year. We'll be doing uh, Memorial Day. That's May 29th. It's my wife Amy's birthday, so feel free to tell her happy birthday. She comes and works her birthday for the family business here, so we appreciate that. Uh, but that'll be Memorial Day from 8 to 4. And, uh, again, the whole team will be out here, guys. It's a fun time to meet everyone at Mr. Maple. We've got an excellent team. I thought one of our best compliments ever last uh, at the spring open house was Lee Todd telling us how well our team uh, orchestrated everything that was going on and how organized it was. And I just appreciate that because a lot of work went into it. And, uh, you know, I appreciate when other people see that, that uh, our team here was really on top of it, had it very well organized. We've got people in place to help you find the plants you're looking for. We've got people in place to help you carry those plants to our holding area. We've got a whole staff down there organizing that for you so you can keep shopping. And we have a team at checkout too. So there'll be a, you know, a lot going on there, but you know, feel free to grab any of us. If you have questions, Tim and I'll be running around uh, being goofy and probably talking to some of you crazy maple people and just getting geeking out and talking about new plants we like and, and that kind of thing. So feel free to come see us. Uh, Brian will be there as well. So there's a you know big team in place here to, to make sure we're helping you. I had a person that was like, uh, one of the questions I had in Messenger this week was like, what happens? Like, do you just go, go, and then it's Black Friday and everybody runs over everybody? And I'm like, well, we had 750 people here last year at Memorial Day. But believe it or not, our place is large enough that it doesn't ever feel crowded. I mean, there's a lot of greenhouses to go into. There's a lot to see. Uh, you can spread out here. It, it's not, you know, you're not right on top of people, especially you may be at checkout a little bit, <laughs> full disclosure, but there's plenty of places to go. You're not going to have to feel crowded in a greenhouse, even with that many people here. So Josh asked, are there any uh, peonies coming to fun flower Fridays? And yes, there are peonies coming to fun flower Fridays. Uh, we've got a lot of them, uh, here at the nursery that are just getting ready. Uh, some of them are starting to bloom here and Probably next week. We're, we're waiting for a lot of them to bloom just so we've got good photos for the website. And a lot of them are just now really getting in good bloom here at the nursery. So, you know, they'll be coming to Fun Flower Fridays uh, in the future. Yeah, uh, guys, Corbin put there in the chat. If you don't know Corbin Wildcat, he's awesome. He's helping us edit videos here as well as Brian. And he said, would love to interview at Open House. So come find Corbin. We'll be doing some interviews, walkthroughs. We'll definitely be shooting some top five content with you guys. So if you're coming to Open House and you know you want to be in a top five, uh, contact us and let us know. We can try to set something up to make sure we put some time aside to do that with you. It makes it a lot of fun. I know um, I know we had a lot of fun top fives with Lee Todd, Grayson Schisler. Uh, they were a lot of fun to get people in there and just kind of, you know, talk to you guys about what you like. It's fun to show other collectors uh, what top five trees someone has, either for an area or just for their individual collection. I know Doug McDougal's in Texas was particularly popular. Because people love to see that kind of thing, and, and we love to get you guys on camera too. I mean, what we're building here is a community, uh, and so we love to, to when you guys participate and be a part of that. And I, I saw something about a celebration being darker. A lot of that could just be environmental factors for this year. Uh, sometimes if you get a frost on a reticulated type as it's starting to leaf out, mm -hmm. you can get darker uh, color and sort of muddy up some of the reticulated uh veins of the leaf so you don't see as much of the reticulation you can get some darker color um, but there's a lot of environmental factors that play in and each and every year you may get a different color I mean purple ghosts some years you may get lavender right. other years you may get a deep 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 purple when we had those fires here in western North Carolina to piggyback up one Tim saying uh, it was a particularly drought uh, ridden year here in western North Carolina a few years ago uh, Amy was pregnant with our first child and I remember you know she would just walk outside her job in Asheville and the skies would be black because we were having a lot of fires. They're very rare. We don't have a lot of natural disasters in Western North Carolina, but that year was particularly weird. And because of the droughts that we were having, everything in the garden, I mean, everything, even by like July, everything was green. It was so odd. So th those definitely can be factors. Um, you know, our trees, we didn't lose any trees during that drought. The maples are ridiculously resilient plants um, so that they can handle a lot of things. It was actually legal to water your yard here during that time. It was it was getting that bad on the drought, uh, but but uh, things got green quick. I thought it was very interesting how every single plant in the garden turned green for that condition, and it was just preservation. Plants are plants are pretty amazing, especially Japanese maples. Um, they're incredibly adaptive, and and they can handle a range of environments. In fact, 
at the Maple Society meeting last year, Jake Grossman was talking about how Japanese maples that are grown in hotter environments sometimes start to adapt and become, you know, more high heat plants. So uh, they're incredibly adaptive plants and it, something, you know, I think everybody should be growing more of, obviously. So Arthur P. said, can I clone Japanese maples in an aeroponics clone machine? That's not a machine that I'm very familiar with. <laughs> I just did some looking up on it. And it, it typically is used, apparently, when you Google it, on things that people smoke. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah. To make clones. But if it's more of a rooting thing, again, you know, rooting Japanese maples, you can do it. Um, but when you're rooting a Japanese maple, you're creating a plant that's more likely to catch disease and fungus um, and have a lot of issues with clogged arteries, essentially, in the plant. And so keep that in mind that just because you can do it doesn't mean that's going to make a good tree for the landscape. So you could always tell who the people were who were into that other plant at garden shows. It always kind of cracked me up because we used to do a lot of garden shows, but people would come up to our Japanese maples that happened to look more like another plant and, and, and smell it. <laughs> and like, no, it ain't that, dude. It's kind of funny. I actually got, here's a funny story for you too. I actually got pulled over in New Jersey one time. Uh, we were driving... Uh, to New Jersey. Uh, this is probably like around 2010, maybe. And we're in a Chevy Blazer and uh, I'm going way too fast. We're on the Jersey Turnpike. I'm going 15 over. Uh, you know, the cars beside me are doing 35 over. So that's just kind of par for the course there. Well, uh, you know, we've got a bunch of one gallon Japanese maples bouncing around in the back of a, of a Chevy Blazer and those lights come on. And I was like, oh man, I'm getting pulled. I'm, I'm going 15 over. Well, the, uh, the officer comes up, I hand him my business card. I say, Hey, you know, we're headed to Ed Shin's house for a little maple get together. And we're just talking Japanese maples with people. And here's my card. I, I do Mr. Maple.com. Uh, first off, I thought I was in the clear because a car went by me doing a hundred, like hundred plus and a, and a 70 I'm doing 85 it's the New Jersey turnpike. <laughs> and, and I'm like, Oh, good thing. He's pulling that guy. <laughs> but no, he gets over behind me and uh, he leaves for a little bit of my information comes back and gives me a warning for impeding traffic. Driving too slow under <laughs> so, conditions. Yeah, I was I was driving 75 or 85 in a 70, so I said, dang, I got to go 90 the rest of the way or they're going to pull me <laughs> over again. So I kept my ticket in hand, and I mean, I just boogied because if, if I got to be going any slower than 90, I was going to get another warning. So I, I just remember him walking to the back of the SUV with the flashlight, shining it on the leaves. Yeah, they were pushed up yeah. against the glass, and then you could see him be, sort of being like, oh, man. He definitely didn't pull me over for speed. He thought he thought he had the bust of the year going on with all these Japanese <laughs> maples in, in the back of this SUV. Anyway, kind of a funny aside there, but uh, uh, we appreciate your questions. We appreciate you being part of our live chats, guys. If you haven't already, drop kick that like button. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way. And ring the bell to get notified. Uh, even if you're subscribed to our channel, you won't see every single time we post. The best way to find out is to ring the bell, and you'll actually get a notification when we're posting. And uh, we really appreciate you being part of our Maple Mafia community. We'll have some Maple Mafia merch for you guys soon. Uh, we just really appreciate y'all jumping in here and John, participating in something we do all the time, which is talk about Japanese maples. John Kitts 2000 says he's got a Jordan showing variegation on some new growth. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it was interesting. He posted the picture in our group, and I was looking at it. So I know exactly the one he's talking about. And a lot of people were saying, I think it's the wrong plant, uh, because it did look almost like a Tiger Rose-ish style on the tip. Now, it could be chloratic. It could be several things. It could be an iron deficiency that makes things look like that. You never really know. Sometimes a branch gets shaded out. You get some weird stuff going on on a juvenile growth, but then it cleans up and it looks normal. Uh, it could be that for sure. I've looked at the picture. It's definitely Jordan because the older growth, uh, I did look at the picture of that as well. That's the first thing I'm going to look at is does the tree look correct? And there's definitely branches that aren't variegated or looking like that. Uh, the best thing to do is always just keep watching it. That's how the cool stuff's found. You never say never. You keep an eye on it. You uh, you identify where that branch is. And you see what's going on. And then if it does stay that way, you, you send signs to Mr. Maple. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, if people wonder why Nebula has been off the website for a while, we have a set of Nebula that have a few things going on where the leaves are curling upwards with reticulation, almost but curling upwards in like a purple curl-like weird fashion uh, on a Nebula, on Nebulas. There's a few Nebulas doing it, and we're watching them. I mean, is it an environmental factor that causes it doing the greenhouse? Sometimes, Does it a sport, this mutation that's been grafted? Things, yeah. so, and sometimes it doesn't make any sense what's happening. You just mark it. 
And, and then sometimes the next year, it's completely normal. That's the honest answer. But nine times out of ten, uh, it nothing happens. But then that one time out of ten, uh, you know, you've got something amazing and new. And by isolating those genes and grafting them, you have a whole new cultivar that's interesting. So you never know. It, I always say, watch it. That's my always answer. Uh, keep an eye on it, tag it, and see if it continues. Uh, you know, we when we evaluate plants here, I always like to let people know uh, we, we've named a lot of plants here, and uh, we haven't put that many in the trade, uh, surprisingly enough, but we've evaluated a lot of plants here for other nurseries as well. And part of our evaluation process is the five and seven rules. So we compare it to the five closest things to it for seven years, and we try to get it in different environments. I think oftentimes there's a rush too much to name something, uh, and you're just renaming some traits that are pretty much already out there. And so you want to name the five things that are closest to it and how it's better or different than those. And uh, if you can an- can't answer that question, uh, you know, probably don't need to introduce it. So uh, what we do is we watch it for several years, too, to see if those genetics are continuing to express. And, like, say, for instance, this Jordan that has this one little weird branch on it. If that graft keeps doing that year after year, hey, we're going to start grafting that and up in production. We're going to make sure we've isolated those traits and got them produced. And over time, we may find that that's an interesting new selection that came through as a sport. So, guys, I'm seeing some questions about the food truck. We're still working on a food truck. We've got a couple asks and a couple people that seem kind of interested. We're just waiting for the first one to commit. Um, Had a great food truck last year. He had already committed on a wedding this year, so we won't have the same one as last year. Uh, We're looking for somebody to possibly offer some breakfast items. I have a friend who has a a food truck that does breakfast items, so we put some feelers out there. Uh, We're hoping to have somebody here at 8 a.m. That way, uh, you know, you early birds will have some food for you. Well, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, If you have any other questions, you can always throw them in the comments below this video. We'll take care of them on our next live feed. Uh, We love jumping in here and trying to explain things for you guys and and give you any knowledge we can to give you the best success on Japanese maples. Uh, We've got some great videos lined up this weekend. There's a great showcase and podcast. I think you're definitely going to want to check out that podcast. Uh, The audio version of the podcast lists on Saturdays on all major platforms. But on YouTube, those lists in video format at 8 p.m. on Sunday evenings. So be sure to go and check us out. Support us on those platforms. We really appreciate it. And I do see someone saying meet up at Mezzaluna before the open house. Make sure you got a reservation because this weekend's that weekend's going to be very busy in downtown Hendersonville. You might not be able to park on Main Street, but you, you can definitely get there. You just might have to park another street and walk over. There's a downtown festival going on. Uh, so they will be doing uh, cleanup at that point still. Mo- most vendors may be out of the way, but likely the roads will not be unblocked yet. Yeah, so you can park on the side streets, but not on the main street, down on actual main street. Guys, thanks so much for watching. You know, remember, Fun Flower Friday launches in 17 minutes. And (laughs) take care, y'all. God bless. And have a great day.